everybody telling you hi, Mark. Um, we are doing a, another live at five session, and this is going to be a great session because we are talking about the most important topic going on right now, but it's not COVID. We're talking about lawn maintenance. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I put those in the same category, but uh, pretty not fun. quite the same category. But you know, it's a it's a pertinent topic in the ag world right now. So, yeah. um, lawn maintenance with Mark Wilson, horticulture agent. Oh, I pointed the right way. Horticulture agent Mark Wilson, and he's also going to give um, beginner gardeners some tips after we discuss sure. lawn maintenance. Yeah. But um, thanks for being here, Mark. And uh, can you kind of tell us about uh, what areas you cover and what you do for your job first? Yeah, sure. Um, so like you said, I am a horticulture agent. I am a regional horticulture agent for the Northwest region. What that means is for those of you who are familiar with I-49, when you hit Natchitoches to the state line up at the north corner, and then from that corner, which is Caddo Parish over to uh, Lincoln Parish or Ruston, and then down towards Wynn Parish, that, four, that 12 parish square is my area. In that area, I am the regional horticulture agent the regional master gardener coordinator and a regional PSA or food safety Alliance trainer. So you do a little bit of everything. I do a little bit of everything. Um, mainly focusing, trying to focus mostly on homeowner horticulture gardens and commercial, but it's anything agriculture that my other specialists or my other uh, agents in the area don't help or can't get to. I try to fill in. Great. All right. So, um, let's let's jump in right now melissa's saying she has no sound um can everyone hear us y'all just let us know if you can't hear us it could be your computer issue it could be ours so just let us know um we will jump right in because we've had a lot of questions lately on fertilization we put out a video from ron strahan and um it it was on fertilization of lawns and we had a lot of questions so mark you want to jump in on lawn care maintenance yeah no that's actually a great place to start um the reason being is without a healthy fertilized lawn or soil underneath, you probably won't ever really fight and win the fight when it comes to getting a good lawn. Um, fertilization is key. So if you were to, and I'm going to plug us, see if I can do this. Get a <laughs> test. I look, I did it right for this time. You get a soil test. Now, right now the lab is closed and they're trying to get it reopened as fast as they can. But if you end up doing something like that, you get any of those boxes, at your local nursery or eggs office, That'll let you get a customized recipe of what your lawn needs. And once we have that, it's really simple. The one, the one element we know we'll need every single season, no matter what, is nitrogen, though. That's your first number on your fertilizer bag. It goes N, P, and then K. With the N, it's the way we apply it. You'll get your um, recipe back or your fertilizing list back, and it's going to be normally listed as pounds per thousand square feet. Okay. So with pounds per thousand square feet, you want to remember that it may say you need to apply 12. Well, that doesn't mean put 12 out all at once. It means you're going to want to divide that out their whole season. So typically the way we want to look at it is we certainly want to start fertilizing our lawns around tax day. So April, then maybe June, and then come again in August, divided between three applications. Um, with something like Bermuda grass, if you have it at home, it's around five pounds per thousand square feet. For zoysia, we're looking at around two to three pounds. Centipede is about a pound to two. And then St. Augustine, for those up north with, with me, most of y'all have that. It's around two to four pounds. Generally, what, what kind of grasses do you see in, in your uh, around Louisiana lawns, I guess? What's your the, most common grass? The three, I would say, is going to be if you're for St. Augustine, centipede if you're in a really sunny area and then bermuda for those who have a little bit larger lawn and can't really maintain it quite as quite as tightly because it's just a more forgiving lawn um you do see some zoysia out there it's a little more pricey up front but it can produce a beautiful lawn in the end okay um but we, we talked about a little earlier uh before we got live about people who have multiple different types of grasses in their lawn for instance, a very common one you'll see in lawns is centipede in the sunny areas. And then as you uh, transition towards the shade, people will have um, St. Augustine. Okay. For those type of situations, you're going to want to kind of split the difference. So if you say, like I said, St. Augustine wants two to four pounds, centipede only wants one to two. For those transitional areas, you want to try to get maybe closer to that two range. So I would apply two to everything. And then in that St. Augustine section, maybe take an extra pass with your fertilizer spreader giving it a little extra, but still staying pretty close to that two pound range. Okay. That's fair. We got a question earlier um, today asking about stickers in their lawn. 
And so they're having like, I think it's burrweed in the lawn right now. Oh, and they said, burrweed. is there anything that they can do to like fix that now or is it too late in the year? Um, well, it, it's not that it's too late. You can definitely always spray and try to take care of those, some of those. Um, your best bet though in the future would be to get on a, um, a pre-emergent schedule. And we'll get into that in a second. But for now with burrweed, um, there are a few things labeled. Um, I have to... I have to double check myself really fast, but something along the lines of there's a there's a good mixture of Fertilone products or uh, your box brands, your your bears, your all those. They'll be labeled for your generic um, weeds in your lawn. Many of those are labeled for burrweed. The trick's going to be looking for just the they actually call it just that common burrweed. Okay. Um, as of right now, uh, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but I will give you another plug for a resource. Fair enough. Point. If I can do this right. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Louisiana Law and BMP or best management practices down here. So Bob, Michael, Paul, best management practices. You can find that online real easily. I, and and I'll provide a link. Um, yeah, I'll post the link right now. A, this is pretty much going to summarize everything we're going to talk about today. But in the, in the end, it will have a list of chemicals as well for some of your common weeds. Uh, it works really, really well for that. Um, I'm trying to think now with your burrweed, which, which one I would use. Those were management practices. There we go. I just added the link for y'all in the uh, comments. So y'all check out that link. It's for the uh, best management practices for Louisiana lawns. So y'all check out that if you get some time. So I'm trying to think right now it's already up for burrweed. So we're going to have to look, can't look at a pre-emergent. We're going to have to look at a post. Mm -hmm. um, some of the post emergence were not too warm yet. It is a little later than I generally would apply it, but we could still get out there with something like an atrazine. Um, weed be gone or weed free zone are very high are good if are highly effective against it. Uh, both can be purchased at almost any garden center. So that's probably where I would stick with your burrweed problems right now. Um, and then obviously, like I said, I'd get on that pre emergent schedule and try to kind of prevent it from germinating next year and seeding out. Okay. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> we got a pretty fun comment that I'm actually going to put on the stream. Andrew, uh, Andrew Roland said, Caitlin Wallace, this Monday's Monday's date night. So guys, if y'all hear that, um, this is well, thank you for joining us for date night right now during COVID. So y'all hang out with us every Monday. We have this going on. And Great. Mark, you are date night material right now. Uh, I hear that. Uh, that's, that's good to know. Um, but anyways, thanks guys. So yeah. All right, so those are some products you can use. Now we did get another question asking about, you know, weed and feeds and how do you use that in, in your lawn program? Okay, that's actually a great lead in. So uh, sure. weed and feed right now, if it's actually a good thing to go ahead and use. Um, personally, I'm not a very large fan of it and I'll explain why in a second. But if you haven't done anything yet, if you haven't fertilized, if you haven't put any pre-emergent out, by all means, feel free, use the product, use any weed and feed you like. Um, now, going into that, the reason I, I generally say not to is like we discussed earlier with fertilizer. We normally don't put fertilizer out until around tax day, around April. But by that point, a lot of the weeds that we're trying to prevent are already germinated. So really, when it comes to pre-emergence, it's <laughs> there's a lot of windows you can use. Um, basically, though, timely application is key and staying on that, that regimen. Um, first application, typically around February, that'll get you those late cool season, early early warm season weeds. Uh, sometime again around between Easter and Memorial Day, that'll get you your 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 summer weeds and getting you going through. Uh, your set, your third application is around the end of set or end of August, mid September, and then you can choose if you know you have a hard cold season weed product or problem coming in around the end of. November, mid to end of November, and hitting it with a, that same pre-emergent, and then something like MSM Turf can mm -hmm. really kind of put a, a very hard damper on your weed issues. Uh, I'll ask you this question. Eric's coming in with, I have been fighting Virginia buttonweed for years, been using <laughs> MSM in the summer. I have low spots in the yard that hold um, water after heavy rains, but I can't best this um, grass. Okay. Yeah. You, you're fighting a really hard battle with uh, Virginia buttonweed. Um, now MSM turf will work on it. The low part in the, the water is going to be our biggest issue. Um, if it's just a small area that's, you know, you're noticing it, there's the mechanical removal, AKA going and pulling it. Um, 
you can also use for those who just have small little spots popping up around sidewalks or anything, any generic all purpose herbicide glyphosate would work fine. You're going to just kind of spot spray or do the glove test where you just use a cotton, a latex glove, put a cotton glove over the top and you just put the chemical on that glove and then wipe it over the leaves for those larger plants that works on everything. If you're just trying to spot treat, um, but for that low area, I would probably say that the best bet is actually we're going to want to change that soil profile in a bit. And by means of that, I would go through and kind of aerate it slightly and then maybe put a little bit of top dressing with sand, helping that water drain deeper into the soil profile. That'll make it so that the grass is more, has a better chance of growing in that area and suppressing that Virginia buttonweed. Now, Virginia buttonweed, like I said, and you're now noticing it's a it's a hard one to kill. We're, we're, we're trying to help you all and get some more stuff out there, but there's testing being done to find more things for you. Good hope luck. that answer helps, Eric. You try I hope that, that answer out. helps. Uh, best one I can give you is a good luck, and you're doing the right things. Uh, let's just try to get that water out of there and see if we can help it that way. That sounds about right. So what else can you tell us about some lawn maintenance, Mark? All right. So uh, we talked about kind of the getting into that pre-emergent um, and working our way through. The other issues we're going to find are going to be things like insect issues. Now, I hear I get a lot of questions about them. Typically, you're never going to see an insect issue until we get hot. When we start getting really hot and really dry, that's when you're really going to start noticing things like chinch bugs. Now, we do have uh, issues like fall army worms and stuff like that. They're not as common, but when they do happen, they happen, and you will know. Um, for the most part, though, if we do the first steps, keeping that good fertilization, keeping the lawn healthy, we normally don't end up having issues from the insects. So it's all about keeping it growing healthy and strong first, and then it's the same with weed su uh, suppression. If you keep the lawn healthy, the other issues don't happen. Fair enough. Any ways to tell though with insects and because we're going to get questions all the time about they think they have insects or they think they have a, a disease but they don't know which most if not well a majority of our insects that attack our lawns uh, feed via sucking the nutrients out of the, the blades so you can tell real easily if the blades of your grass are all rolling up think of it like an eight and a half piece of paper rolling up long ways if you okay. visualize it that way and you look out and all your grass is rolling up, that's telling me you have an insect issue. Probably at this time of the year, it's probably chinch bugs. Um, if you have chinch bugs, we have a wonderful little um, PDF you can find online on just that. It's in the Louisiana Home Lawn series. But you, uh, an easy way to check is go right along that transition point between the, the living grass and the dying grass area. You're going to want to kind of pull back so you have some exposed dirt. Don't rip it out too hard, but just some exposed dirt about a tablespoon of lemon scented dish soap. I'm not sure the science behind the lemon, but it needs to be lemon scented. I, I know that. I have, I'm sure it has to do with the citric acid, but in lemon scented dish soap, about a tablespoon per two gallons, and then pour that two gallon uh, thing of water right in that one spot, maybe a six inch or one foot by one foot area. And just wait a few seconds, maybe 30 seconds, and you will start seeing chinch bugs if you have them start crawling out of the ground. They're going to look like a small little black insect about the size of the tip of your ballpoint pen the adults will have a kind of a white x to a white spot on the on their back but you'll you'll know pretty quick you'll see a good number of them if they're actually there and killing your lawn okay um i gotta step in because eric's asking one more question he said thanks sure. for i do have live oaks in the yard will the use of msm have an effect on the live oaks msm l sulfuron um it should not, as long as you're following the label, use the label, follow, I guess I have to say it that way. The label on any chemical is the law. We always want to follow it uh, based on its application rate and its its uh, application point. I would obviously try not to spray it near, like on the tree or around it. Um, go out there early morning when it's not too windy, but it should not have any effect on it, especially a large established tree. Even if you were to get some on it, most chemicals are not going to harm it too badly. Uh, but yeah, definitely follow the label on that one. Um, okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, um, an issue, but yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely. All right, thanks, Eric. Alex asking is asking, do they have an organic grass weed and feed safe for turtles and pets? Now, all of them will even even the the non organic ones. They're all be safe for pets. Um, turtles, even them. Uh, the, the herbicide is unless you have a cell wall uh, or you you produce or you get your energy through photosynthesis. None of them will harm it. Uh, they're very slow release. It's not too much of an issue. I'm not sure on the organic side, 
Uh, I'm sure there are. I'm not familiar with them. That would be something that you would have to contact your local garden center or anywhere you would buy them and see what products they may have available. Okay. Uh, just not familiar with those off the top of my head. I'm, I'm sorry. I can, but I will say if uh, before we leave, I'll add my contact information. I'll give it to Anna to put in here or contact your local agent. They'll be more familiar with the products in your area than I would. And if you are in my area, I will get you that information either way. Yeah, fair enough. And don't forget, guys, I forgot to mention this at the beginning. All of our agents are working from home right now, but they are working. So please email them with any questions. Right, Mark? Absolutely. Uh, you, you all are seeing one of the walls of my apartment right now. <laughs> I'll, I'll put in a link, guys, to um, to find your local agent if it's not Mark, so you can email them with some of your questions too later on. Um, we have a question from Donna. This is a little bit off topic, but she has black mold on her crepe myrtles. How does she treat? Okay, so she's probably you probably have Donna. Yeah, I can see your name yeah. actually. You probably have sooty mold. Um, it's pretty common. It's actually the sooty mold itself isn't going to harm anything. Um, if it's along the trunks, is what I'm assuming you have. If that's it, pressure wash it. If it's a larger tree or if it's a small tree, something like a garden hose, a little soap and water, scrubbing it will come off. But the trick's going to be getting rid of the problem that's causing it. And what's causing it is one of either probably two things, either aphids or crepe myrtle bark scale, depending on where you are. Both of which, what they've done is they consume nutrients from the plant. They can't, their, their eyes are bigger than their stomach, so they can't eat it all. And they excrete sugar water or honeydew. And that's what that powdery mildew is growing, or sooty mold, <laughs> sooty mold is growing on and causing that black uh, coloration. So it's going to be killing off those, those insects, those pests, in order to prevent the, the black formation. Um, Imidacloprid is a systemic insecticide that works great. Uh, fall, you can buy it, on, buy it online actually now, but you can find it in almost every box store, any, any garden center. It'll tell you, you know, follow the label. We have a wonderful, again, we have a wonderful publication on crepe myrtles that talks about this. It'll give you some some recommendations on named products as well as uh, applications. Typically, though, the label will tell you to spray the plant and then you do a soil drench with the remainder. Uh, it's about a gallon per cal caliper inch of the tree trunk. You'll pour it around the base and you'll want to do that. If you know you have this issue, it's been an issue over and over. Once a year, you'll want to continuously treat that same problem to prevent it from coming back. Great. That's an awesome answer. Thank you, Mark, for that one. No, so uh, I, I do a lot with those up here. So uh, yeah. like it's it's a common question we get. And then Jean-Pierre, let's move it back to lawn care. She's saying, I put down weed and feed about three weeks ago. I have noticed some of the weeds dying, but no grass taking the place of dead weeds. What would be my next step? My lawn's predominantly centipede and St. Aug. Okay. Um, so with the so the wheat the wheat the herbicide is working faster obviously the, the fertilizer it will but um San Augustine it definitely is not what you'd call a racehorse it's more of the show horse it looks pretty but it is not going to get there going fast so it's going to take a little while for that to start creeping back into those dead spots those weaker areas the fertilizer is going to help and it will get there if you're trying to speed up the process um Obviously, there is sodding. You could go and put strip sodding down, get one piece, just a small area, one piece, cut it up, put a little spots down, just make sure to water it in real well and keep it watered. Um, with centipede section, you could seed it. Now, seeding you can find online. You're going to want to try to look at photos based on the varieties you find to make sure the blade sizes are about the same. That way, you don't have this one spot that looks a little different. They're all very similar, but you can tell on colors. Uh, some are a little lime, limey or green than others. Uh, I've done it myself, so I know I know that problem. Had about a five foot space that looked very different than the rest. But I will tell you that takes about twenty to thirty days to germinate and get going. And it's going to be a lot of you know you're going on vacation once we're out with all this, and you're able to leave in the summer. Uh, you're going to want to make sure somebody's there throughout that first season to really make sure it stays watered. Uh, at least all all of these everything when it comes to this is one inch of water a week. Uh, you can buy a cheap little rain gauge online. Or honestly, if you got an old, um, I'm the best kind of kind of mug that someone gave you. Uh, I put those outside, and just kind of let it rain, and I'd measure it based on milliliters. You can figure out the, the acre inch that way. But it's one inch of water is what you really need, and that'll tell you if you don't get it. That means you need to go back and supplemental water your lawn to keep it healthy. Um, can you talk about um, sure. when to sod your lawn? If you want to sod? Sure. Yeah. So um, when it comes to sodding, we're kind of spoiled in Louisiana. Uh, we really can do it almost year round. I mean, I would not recommend going out there when it's very, very cold. Our February or January, February's 
But for the most part, ideally it's March to September. But with, with like I said, with our environment, even when it's dormant, it'll still set some roots. Okay. Uh, it's just, it, it's really going to come down to when you have the time or when you can pay for somebody to have the time to do the sure. soil prep. Sod is sodding the biggest part and the, mo- the part I see most common with homeowners is it's soil prep beforehand. You're going to want to go through, rake that soil area. If you, you know, you can either, some people use a small little manis tiller, a little hand tiller and kind of chop up the surface. Otherwise you want to use a steel rake, kind of rake and break up the surface to allow those roots that you're laying down to peg or to take root into the natural soil. Uh, they should be able to do it within a season pretty well. The other stick is going to be making sure you really water it in. Uh, that's going to be for the first week, almost daily watering, if not daily water, depending on how hot it is. It's got to stay watered. Okay. Um, going back to seed though, because we're still filling in the same holes, uh, that timeline, you're looking at around May to August. The trick's going to be you want warm nights for germination. And the reason we want to do it no later than August is we want to give it enough time, even if you do it late, so that it has time to set root, get established before we start hitting into those cold nights. Where can people um, like find grass seed if they want to seed their lawn? So you should be able to find it at any local garden center, big box store. They'll have them in the specific variety you're looking for, say like for Bermuda. Uh, there's a beautiful one out there. It's called princess. Um, there's a few different princess series lines, but that one you could go order online. I will say some of those seeds get ready for, for folks who are looking at it. It can get kind of expensive. Um, remember. And also that while St. Augustine can't, there are seed, it's very limited. So if you are attempting to do that, I would recommend highly just going with sod. It's very hard to find and it's it's very difficult to get them to go. I'm going to ask you, um, what do you recommend for like a, a new person who wants to take care of their lawn? Like what kind of lawn would you recommend to them? You know, centipede. Um, if you are in a small residential area um, and you just, you really like that dark green look, I'm going to recommend St. Augustine. It takes a little more work. It's not too difficult as long as you kind of follow basic procedures. You, it's one, you know, you're going to have a calendar, you'll set it up and just kind of follow it real easily. Um, if you're in a really sunny spot, centipede works great. And if you, or if you have a larger area or a sunny area, uh, Bermuda is wonderful. The reason is like we talked about a little bit ago, I joked St. Augustine is kind of your show pony. Your Bermuda is your racehorse. Even the, the hybrid varieties, they're going to take off and really fill in an area fast. Uh, the only thing I wouldn't recommend, unless you just have a very large, large area and you're not really worried about overall appearance, you're just looking for green, is I would stay away from common Bermuda. I would stick with a hybridized one. Okay. It's wonderful. That's what you're going to see on soccer fields and things like that, the public fields. Uh, it's just, it's not, it's not what most folks would consider a lawn grass. It's more of a uh, athletic field grass. Okay. Gotcha. Um, oh, Janet and Mark, they asked the question that we talked about earlier. How can I get rid of stickers growing around my driveway? My dog walks there and it bothers her paws. So with the l- l- lawn burrowee, which is the sticker weed, uh, we kind of talked about a little ago, but um, things like a, it's a little later. Um, I, this is about the end of it. So you want to get it out before the end of April. Typically I say post-emergence, like November to April for it, but it's atrazine and then a weed be gone or weed free zone. Uh, those all can be purchased at a garden center, should be able to be purchased at most box stores. Um, there'll be a great combination. There's a lot of options out there, though. If you have something already in your chemical shed that you're using, just go look and see if it's labeled for uh, lawn burrweed. Um, for those who just showed up and did pug it, but I'll hold it up again, see if I can do this right this time. Haha, there we go, did it right. Uh, Louisiana Lawn BMP Guide, a very nice little guide to walk you through basic steps all the way through everything we talked about today, but it does have a nice section about spraying for pre and post emergence for these weeds. And the BMP guide guys is in the comments. Check it out. I've put a couple of different links in the comments so far. Um, we got a question Mark from, from Larry. He's always looking for lawn care help. We put out a weed and feed about four weeks ago. The grass is predominantly Bermuda, although a lot of weeds came out as well as some additional Bermuda. What do you suggest to get my, my Bermuda to blow up? We have full sunlight. Okay, the full sunlight is definitely going to help. Um, if you're having additional weed pressure, uh, it's the fertilization is going to be key because um, these weeds they are seasonal. So these these warm season weeds will die off, and then cool season weeds will take over. So you have a you have some transitional periods where the lawn will have time to fill in and really pressure. The healthier the lawn, the thicker the lawn, the less weed issues you're going to have. Weeds are weeds are only going to take advantage in weak spots. So that if you have a really bad area that's telling me that there's something going wrong there. I'm going to recommend it. I'll grab my box again. 
a soil sample. Uh, taking a soil sample, like I said before, the lab is closed right now, but they are working on getting it reopened. That'll help us to figure out what new soil fertility is there so that we can adjust it to make it so that the lawn will be a little healthier and a little happier. Um, that should suppress a lot of the weeds. Um, I wouldn't go back in just yet. I'd probably wait to that um, September application with a post a uh, pre-emergent again. You won't. I won't be able to stop the weeds that are germinating right now, but I can stop them uh, pre-emergent wise, not post, but pre for the next set, and then get on that regimen so that next February we can stop the weeds that are you're seeing right now from germinating. Okay. What about um, we haven't harped on like disease control yet? So like. Okay. Okay. Um, no, I can, I can get into that one. That's not a problem. Uh, so diseases, it's, it's going to be the same issues as insects. Uh, scouting is key. We want to get on top of it first. Lawn health will prevent a lot of these, but there are some that you just got to watch out for uh, right now while we're still having cool nights, uh, a lot of rain, especially for us up here, it's going to be brown patch also called large patch, uh, depending on what publication you read, same disease. They just like to change the names on us. I blame the pathologists. That's fine if you are my colleagues. Uh, but they, they, it's the same idea. Cold, wet areas. You're going to see a transitional period. It's the best way or transitional point you'll see to look for. If you look at your healthy lawn again, you'll see where it's going to go from a dead section to your lit, growing section, your green section. Right along that edge of that area, you're going to want to look for a brownish bronzed ring. That's a good indicator that tells me that you have brown patch. Uh, the trick is if you think at all, if you even have the inkling that you may have a fungal disease or bacterial disease, the trick's going to be reducing water and do not fertilize. Uh, if you fertilize the, the bacteria, the microorganisms are much better at taking on that nitrogen and growing and, and reproducing faster than the grass will ever be. And so you're actually feeding your issue. Um, so you want to make sure if you think you have brown patch, let's find out if you have it first before you put that application down of fertilizer because you won't be able to keep up. Jeez. Okay. Uh, it's, it's not too bad. There's a ton of products labeled for it. We have wonderful publications on it online. Uh, almost any of your generic lawn fungicides will cover brown patch, large patch, and a bunch of others. Uh, but that's definitely one you want to make sure on. Um, I'm trying to think. We kind of skipped over one section. I'm going to hop back to insects if that's all right for folks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Okay, before you do, Mark, um, we have a question from David. He generally puts down a Scott's weed and feed. What would you suggest as just a feed, and how often can I just fertilize, basically? Okay, okay. So with fertilizing, uh, going back to that, it's going to be based on your fertility up front, so that soil test will help. But if depending on what kind of grass you have, um, it's gonna that's going to tell me how much fertilizer to put down. Now, if you've never done a soil test before, I still would recommend doing it. This first year, we could go through and put something like a triple 13 down. Uh, you really don't need it, though. Mostly, it's going to be nitrogen unless you know you have issues, low fertility issues. For Bermuda, you're looking at about five pounds per thousand square feet. Zoysia is about two to three pounds. Centipede's about one to two. And St. Augustine, I just saw it pop up. That's about two to four pounds uh, per thousand square feet of nitrogen application. So you can find a large variety of fertilizers at your garden centers. You're just looking for that first number on the bag, which is the nitrogen number, to be the largest, ideally. Um, they have a bunch of specially made turf fertilizers um, that, that will all sell. Every box store, everyone will have them. Uh, I would recommend sticking with one of those and just rate, base that ratio off of that two to four pound rate. If you've already put weed and feed down, um, I'm assuming you probably put it down recently around April-ish or a little earlier, I would wait and do that second half of that application into or third of that application into June and the last one in August. Now, remember, folks, those numbers I gave you, like the five pounds or two to three pounds, that's divided between three applications. So it'd be about a, some of those would be a pound per application, three different applications a year, all April, June and then August. Uh, your soil test results will get back if you do one. They don't tell you that always. You got to really read all that supplemental material. It will just tell you 12 pounds per thousand square feet. It doesn't mean put out 12 pounds at once. What you can do, you can actually kill your lawn if you do that. So you got to really read all that supplemental material, take care, take care to pay attention to those. And for everyone um, probably asking, is the soil lab open right now? The soil lab is not open from my understanding right now. They are trying with all the backlog. One person is going in just to keep, you know, the boxes coming in so they're not sitting on the loading dock. They are working on trying to get it reopened. Now it's possible within this last few days, they have changed something. I'm not sure I'm not on it. Completely. But as of right now, it was not open as of Friday. And they were they were just trying to get everything back up and running beforehand. 
Hopefully sooner than later. Hopefully yeah. sooner than later. Uh, yeah. But uh, they're, they're pretty quick. Um, I'm sure they're going to have all hands on deck as soon as it's open, so they'll, they'll be able to pull these through really quick. Definitely. Uh, all you're going to want to do for the homeowners, unless you know specifically, you're just going to want to do the, gen the general um, soil test. You don't need to add all the supplemental portions. Uh, so you'll see a checkbox inside that box I held up, which I'll hold up again. You can pick up at any garden center or local nurse or any ag center office or local nursery. In there is a sheet. It, you'll have a bunch of options. You just want the generic general lawn uh, or general uh, test and then just to write the type of lawn you have to make it a little easier. So they'll specifically give it for your issues or your uh, information you need. Bam, you already gave David his, his next answer to his question. You already knew it, which was where can I get a soil test kit? There you go. Uh, any ag office, any local nursery. Um, most nurseries do have them. I'd call ahead just to make sure they may not, they may be outright, especially right now, because uh, we can't ship out anymore. Um, if you're up in my region, if you're in the nor uh, Northwest, most of our offices do have them. I've actually left four of them out this morning. I drove by my office, took them out, threw them, just set them outside for folks to pick up. Uh, we're, we're trying to help our best. Most of our offices, we are still working, like Anna said earlier. So we were able to get you stuff. Um, I actually have the one that I keep holding up. I'm going to uh, do a paper route more or less tomorrow and, and kind of toss it out to a, to a homeowner who needed one. So I can help when I can. Great. Um, John's asking, do you know of a good lawn weed killer that doesn't think carpet grass is a weed? Hmm. So we want a weed killer that's not going to target carpet grass. Um, it was John. John, I'm going to actually ask you to go ahead and email me that one. I'll, I can get you an answer. I'm not sure of one right off the top of my head. I know there's probably one out there, and I can probably find you an answer for something. But uh, what's, what's your email, Mark, so I can put it in the comments? My email is mawilson at agcenter.lsu.edu. All right, John, did you hear that? He will just email him, and he'll get you an answer to that. Yep, um, there's my email. Bam. Popped in. Yeah, you email me. Any, anybody else who's, who's live right now, if you have questions, um, if I, I, I will try to help you. And if it's something specific I can't help you with without getting some photos and all that, I'll forward you over to your local agent so they can kind of get you some direct assistance if it's something I'm not familiar with because it's more of a, cult, a, a uh, area, a cultural thing. And David is asking, what was the cost for the soil test? Do you know? I want to say it's sixteen dollars for the first one, and ten dollars for every additional one. Uh, please don't quote me on that. Uh, it's in the box, though. It'll tell you in that. I'm fairly positive it's sixteen, though. Okay. Um, but like I said, all of that'll be in there. The box itself that I was holding up, uh, we give it to you. It's already got potions paid. So once you pick it up, you open it up. It'll have written instructions on how to take the sample, how to fill out the form. You fill it out. You put your samples back in. Put your check in there. Seal the box and drop it off at any post office. And on a normal time frame, it was 10 to 14 days. You'd have your results back right now. It's 10 to 14 days after the date of reopening. Maybe give them a little extra time because they're probably going to be back a little, excuse me, backlogged. Yeah. Um, and I just found actually a whole list of where you can find soil test kits. So David, that's you I just put it in the comments. Um, and what were you about to talk about, Mark? You were about to go back to insects, weren't you? Oh, about to insects because, uh, we always get issues um, and questions about folks who have uh, fire ants. And uh, it's, it's kind of a fun topic with agents because we, we differ on our opinions. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a believer of I don't try to kill all the fire ants in my lawn, never have. They're too beneficial. Uh, I never had chinch bug issues or army worm issues or any of those because the fire ants would kill them. Fire ants will take on almost anything that they, can, they think they can beat. Um, that's the reason why we really don't see a whole lot of ticks down here unless you go into the deeper woods. You go up north, you'll find ticks down here. You don't see them because they crawl on the ground and the fire ants will kill them. Um, so I always try to isolate them to the corner. I push them to the back corner of my property where I don't see them, you know, the back corner of a bed where I don't bother, but they can have their massive, you know, three foot tall colony and they can just have that section. It's theirs to, to own. But there are a bunch of different things out there. Right now, they are foraging, they are feeding. So this is a good time of year to go out there with a bait. Um, plenty of baits. All baits are is an, is an insecticide mixed with a edible source. A lot of people use corn or a lot of companies use cornmeal. Um, it'll work great. What that happens is the reason I recommend those is the insect, the ant will take that food back into the colony and feed it to all the others, including the, the young. So that it'll actually kill the colony with, within out. There are other things such as like bifenthrin, um, very commonly used in spring and summer. 
those are contact insecticides. So that's the kind of stuff you normally will buy where it's kind of a powder you sprinkle over the top and it, as they walk on it or as they kind of go near it and touch or interact with it, it kills them there. Those do work great, but they will require you to do multiple applications to get rid of them. Uh, there is an old wives tale about taking a scoop of ants from one mound and dropping them on the other. That's actually the one I wanted to get on. Unless you are living in a very large pasture or very large property, the likelihood that that would work to the success rate you're hoping for is very little. Ants, especially fire ants, um, they're normally, most of the time those are all going to be satellite nests of one made, mat, one centralized colony. Uh, they can they can colonize a very large area. So even though they may be different in their their tracers, their, their heritage, if you will, their queen, they are closely enough related that while they may kill each other at first, after a while, they're going to ignore each other and just crawl back to their own homes or try to find their way back home. That's why I recommend getting those baits. Um, for those also, if you have irrigation or if you know, if you've seen these ants crawling across your lawn or your property going towards a water source, that water source is a great little second spot to go ahead and put some of those baits. Because while the, the ants aren't necessarily walking over there to get water, if they see if they, if they see food that's readily available, they're, they're highly likely to pick some of that up and carry it back while they're at it. Um, but I just want to get on. And then uh, switching for those folks who are asking about vegetables and all that earlier, while I'm on the topic of fire ants, uh, spinosad is one that is labeled for the use in a garden area for fire ants. Um, read the label, obviously, for your applications on, on all of these chemicals. Definitely follow the label. Label is the law. Um, to do, yeah. That's uh, I just put down the Louisiana Home Lawn Series Red Imported Fire Ants link. Bam. So that, that link will give you a whole list of active ingredients. So uh, what I would really much recommend is what I used to do, and I recommend a lot of homeowners, open that link if you're going to the box store and just take a photo of that last little paragraph, it's going to be a chart, and that will let you have a list of all the active ingredients. So when you're going to the store, you can just compare that to the label and see and make sure it's actually something that's that you're not going to waste your money on. Because unfortunately, out there, there are products that just don't have the success rates we're hoping for, but are technically labeled for it. Everything that's on that list has been tested to prove that it works. Amen. Um, David's asking, so when fertilizing, mm -hmm. divide it up for three times a year, late March, June, August? And what about a winterizer? Um, winterizers, that's going to come down to fertility. Uh, really, you don't have to winterize your lawn. Um, that, that would be a big thing if you lived further north. Uh, but we really don't get that cold to where everything truly shuts down. They go dormant, but they don't 100% shut down. Uh, yes, definitely three times a year. Uh, April, April, June, August around is the three times I typically use. But uh, that Louisiana lawn uh, BMP guide, depending on the type of grass you have, it'll actually have a chart in there that'll explain to you about the, the, the amount of fertilizer to put out and when to put it out, like we discussed. Um, but yes, definitely, like you were saying, yes, it's three times a year. So whatever that number is that you get on your soil test, or if you just want to use the generic ones that are in the book, it's divided that sample out three times. The BMP guide does explain that. It actually shows you, uh, it gives you a chart, a calendar about five or 10 pages in that will show you um, putting out one pound or half a pound or three pounds, depending on what the time is. And actually, I can probably show you all if you'd like. And I'm going to put that back into the comments, guys, what he's talking about right now. So you'll check that out. So I don't know how well this is going to show up, but we'll try. Uh, that is actually only page five in that guide, but it actually has a table down here that y'all can't see for anything apparently, but it does have a chart down there that actually will show you putting out how many pounds they're recommending per month. So sometimes something like uh, centipede or carpet grass, they're doing it down to a half a pound in April, half a pound in June and half a pound in August for those fast release fertilizers. The slow release, they're putting a pound out in April and a pound out in July. And that'll do the same effect. That'll get you your two pound ratio that we're looking for and cover everything. Um, going back to ants just for a minute, Larry, Larry was asking just plain cornmeal, nothing added kills ants. <laughs> No, no, no. So the cornmeal is just the bait they're using. Um, uh, now, cornmeal, technically, it can. Uh, there, that is actually an organic insecticide. Um, it That is 100% on preference. Uh, the way it works is they're going to have to consume a whole lot of it, though, before it actually does much. But the the cornmeal is actually just an additive into the baits. That, that's all I was stating. So you're going to want to buy a bait. Um, 
The, the reason I was talking about the cornmeal is it can attract other little insects as well. Um, if you have a dog like mine used to, he's nosy. Uh, it doesn't hurt them, but he'd go stick his nose in it to smell it, and it's right on top of an anthill, so he'd get his nose bit. Uh, <laughs> but that's all I was mentioning on the cornmeal. It's just part – it's an active – it's a part of a uh, the product. It's just the, the, the inactive portion that they're using to attract the ants to come to it. Okay, okay. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. It's D-I-V-A-D. He's been saying, I've been saying that about fire ants for years. Great predators in the garden. So he agrees with you. Yeah. I mean, they, they really are. Uh, they're wonderful little things. It's just, you got to get them away from where you, your active areas. So, um, and be nice to your utility guys. Don't put them off by the, the gas meter or your AC unit. Well, yeah, that's fine. Um, they're not going to like you. Fair enough. Push them uh, back to that corner. Honestly, uh, my best part I've left them is actually right by a tree and mulching anyway. So I'm not really caring if they're there. And I don't have any ants. I don't have anything else in my lawn now because I'll just isolate and move around. Um, so David was asking, do you have a go-to fertilizer or pre-emergent that you use that you would recommend? I'd not really. Uh, uh, it's uh, I'm an agent, which means we kind of ball on a budget. <laughs> Uh, I use really, I go look at the labels. I see what ingredients or chemicals are in the pre-emergence, which one I want to use, uh, depending on what I'm trying to, what I'm having my biggest issues with. And then that's how I base it off that. I base it off a of cost per pound. Uh, so if you're using something like Scott's, I believe we talked about earlier, I think you were the one who mentioned it. Uh, if that's one that you like, you've had good results with them. Uh, they make pre-emergence. They, they, all of them will have their own bag varieties. Uh, but it, it's more of a knowing it's doing that that diagnostic up front. It's doing that scouting, figuring out what your weeds are, so we know which pre-emergence to put out. There are all obviously most of them are general for homeowners. They're all going to be general, all-purpose pre-emergence. They're going to be a combination of different things. But if you know you have very specific issues, you can kind of tailor it towards that issue. Okay, um, I'm not sure if this is really your area, Mark, with horse pastures. But Larry's asking. So, in a horse pasture, what would you recommend to kill ants, but safe to horses? Uh, bifenthrin is fine. Um, it's, that's going to be the contact one. Uh, we do have a specialist in LSU who can help you with that. Um, if you email me, I can try to get that information to them. But I, I am not familiar with many of them that are dangerous to horses other than the, the restricted ones. So anything that you could buy as a homeowner, uh, the ratios are low enough that it, will not, it should not harm them. Now, I will say, obviously, follow the label. Yep. Um, most of the baits would be fine. They're, again, the volumes, the, the ratios of chemicals are very, very low. But for that kind of question, please email me, and I will fad, forward that over to a uh, our horse and pasture specialist. Gotcha. Um, can, okay, Mallory is asking. Mallory went to school with us, by the way. Oh, today my neighbor found a slimy algae in her yard. I looked it up, and I think it's – I'm not quite sure. Have you ever <laughs> – uh, you're reading it, Mark. Have you ever heard of that? Uh, it, it doesn't really matter which it is. Um, any of the algaes, um, it's it's because it's getting so much rain right now. Uh, it's not going to harm anything. It's just because we're getting so wet, so much rain, it, they're able to grow. Uh, if you don't like it, uh, you can kind of – well, it's, it's because it's staying shaded. You can, get, you can go out there and kind of scrape it off, stomp it down, move it around. It'll, it'll die or just wait a little bit, wait for it to dry out, and it'll kind of just disappear back into the ground. It's almost all, they're all there. All those little spores, all those little algae things, they're all there. It's just, unless you have favorable conditions, they're not going to grow. Um, they kind of, I'm glad you actually brought up the question. Can we, I can kind of lead into that with um, fungi. I got a question yesterday and I'm getting a bunch about fairy rings and mushrooms. Mm -hmm. um, typically those are the same idea as that algae we just discussed is they're only, they're always there, but they're only going to pop out the ground during favorable, favorable conditions. So right now, high rain, a lot of water, they're going to start popping out the ground. The trick's going to be your, to, to try to slow them up. And if you don't like them, they're not harming anything But if you don't, because they're only feeding on the dead material. So normally that means there was probably a dead tree or stump there at one point, some old roots. Uh, it's possible you have a very, very thick thatch layer, something that they're able to feed on that's dead already. Um, but if you don't want them there, there are a lot of granular fungicides you can put out. Some of them you can put out at the same time as your pre-emergence and everything else. Um, if you, if you're, if you're a believer, I have a few folks up here who they preemptively strike for a brown patch, uh, with any fungicide, it's going to be a regime. Once you get on it, you got to kind of stick to it, uh, to keep, keep control of the diseases, but you can put those granulars out 
and uh, kind of reduce it. If you do see them in your lawn, uh, it's going to be, again, that's scouting. Once you know, once every other day or so, get a cup of coffee, walk your lawn, walk in areas. And if you start to see them pop out the ground, you want to stop them and kind of knock them over or use your hand and kind of pull and twist them out before they have an opportunity to open up. If you see the actual little mushroom head, all that's there for is to spread the spores. It's the fruiting body of the fungi. Most of the fungi is underground and only produces that, that fruiting body above just to, just to move around and spread more spores. So if you see it, you need to get it out of there before it opens up. Okay. If you're not sure if it's opened up, the easiest way to tell is, well, pull it out. And then if you're pulling it out, I recommend getting something like a Walmart bag, something that's very thick, the plastic, gripping it and sealing it up so that if there are spores, they don't fall on the ground, they're falling into that bag. But if you look underneath and there's uh, the little lines will be called gills underneath. If they look like they've kind of opened up and they're kind of uh, not straight lines, that means it's probably already dropped its spores. It's already, you've waited a little too late. If it's still nice and tightly uniform, it's you probably hit it in time. Yeah. That, that's as good as you're gonna get without me being a pathologist. And I'm hey, sure Mar, that was people hop good. in and tell me I'm wrong, but hopefully not. Uh, Jared's asking, uh, you, you talked about it earlier, but what's the best cost effective way to get rid of Virginia buttonweed? Uh if you have a lot of Virginia buttonweed, um doing it by hand works. Spot spraying with glyphosate or a non-selective herbicide. Uh, it's really the, the most effective, but things like MSM turf do have a pretty good reaction to it. It does kind of push it back. Uh, Virginia buttonweed is a, a hardy weed. <laughs> it's a really hardy weed. It's hard to push back. So that's really the only methods right now. It's it's staying on top of it is your big, your big one. Now, obviously, like I said before, the healthier the lawn, the better. Uh, there is some control seen with um, like a weed-free zone. Um, 2,4-D around April time can work pretty well, uh, but repeated repeated uses of MSM turf during the summer can really put a hard stop to it. Fair enough. Um, Gianna's asking, burr clover stickers have taken over my yard <laughs> along with annual poa and dichondra in the wet spots. I use pre-emergence and spot treat, but I can't get rid of it. I've been working out for four years. What do I do? Uh, the wet spots, the, the only way we're going to get rid of those is – Try to find a way to push some of the water out. We talked about a little earlier with some other folks. Um, you can either you can buy just a fork, a simple little yard fork or hay fork, something with, with or you can go rent. Although I was informed today, you can actually buy an air a hand aerator with three plugs at the box stores. Um, aeration will help overall. That one, especially that wet area, putting those plugs in, filling those plugs back in with sand will help with drainage, help moving that water through the profile down into the deeper profile of the soil, which will help get that, that water out of there. And that will slow up some of the weeds. Um, getting that lawn healthier will help push that lawn into that area, fill it in so the weeds can't grow. Uh, with If you have, I already forgot the weeds you said you had, oh, burr weed, um, applications, weed-free zone, um, weed be gone, atrazine, it's getting a little bit warmer, but it's still okay to be used atrazine right now, as long as we want to get it out there before we start getting too much warmer in the days and evenings. Uh, but it still works wonderfully for a, uh, a pre-emergent from next time around. The weed be gone and weed free zone will work as a kind of a post for now. They'll help kind of slow it up. Now it's not going to kill them necessarily right off the bat, but it definitely will help with that future generation on almost all of those. Fair enough. Um, yeah, we haven't really talked about proper mowing height on grass. Is that important? Depending no, that, that is very important. I'm glad we're jumping back. Uh, that's good. Yeah. So no matter how healthy you are, you're going to want to make sure you do mow it at the right height. Uh, certain grasses uh, depend on that height to kind of suppress those weeds. So for instance, people with uh, St. Augustine, if you mow your St. Augustine too short, you're actually opening up to more insect pressure, more disease pressure than you realize. Uh Starting off, you're going to want to make sure all your lawnmower blades are very sharp. Uh, if you notice that your lawn kind of has this brownish tinge after you're cutting this, this light brown and you notice the grass blades are kind of torn rather than cut, not only is it not really – it's kind of unsightly, but you're actually opening up those areas for diseases to come in and for transpiration, so it's losing more water through those wounds. Uh, so sharpen those blades as best you can. I do mine once a year. I probably could do it more often because uh, I'm not the knees mower. If there's a stick there, I hit it. I'm not going to lie. Uh, but for, for things like Bermuda, now, you never want to take any more than about a third of the grass blade away at a time. So if you let it go for a – you haven't mowed it yet this year and it's foot tall, you're not going to want to go cut it at, at you know, two inches or an inch. Like you're going to want to slowly take it down. Um, 
If it's a foot, you might have to go get a sickle to bring it down. Uh, for, for most of our Bermudas, depending on the type you have, you can go anywhere between three quarters of an inch to an inch and a half. Uh, now remember that's if you're going for that really short, that three quarter, that golf course you type grass, that's a that's a slow step down. You don't want to just start off at three quarter. You want to slowly every mow once a week, bring it slowly shorter and shorter. Um, Zoysia, it's about one to two inches. Centipede, about the same, one to two. And then your St. Augustine, like I said, is about two to three inches where you want to leave it. Um, some people like it a little longer. If you like that that softer feel, some people will leave it about three to four inches. That comes down to more of a preference, but those are more the the minimums you want to leave them at. Fair enough. Uh, but yeah, that that'll definitely help and with your uh, your pressures for your weeds and your your insects and diseases. I don't want to keep you on too long, Mark, but um, I did have a question earlier that I did skip um, just because it wasn't related to lawn as much. But we will definitely go back and answer it. I got to find it first. Hold up. There's a lot of questions. You've been getting a lot of questions over here. Let me check. Hold up. Well, while you're searching, I can talk. Oh, you found it. Okay. Found it. Melissa was asking when the Ag Center pamphlet on uh, squash and pumpkins says squash needs a lot of sun. Does that mean direct sun morning or after? Okay. Sun? That's that's actually really good because we were going to move into gardens anyway. Um, so there's a all of our vegetable crops. Uh, you're going to want about eight hours of direct sun. Now the best way to tell if it's direct sun is I I'm just keen and it's called the shadow test. Um, you can get a flag, anything a yard gnome, anything that's tall enough that will cause a shadow. Go out there where you think you want to put your garden, put that item there, look at it, see if there's a shadow, come back about every two hours or so. Or you're, you're stuck at home anyway right now. makes it easy. Go look and see if you still have direct sunlight hitting it. It's causing a direct shadow. You're not seeing any other things hitting it. That means you're probably pretty good for that area. Uh, that would be where I would plant them. For those, it's looking for eight hours. So almost all of our fruit, anything that's put in an actual fruiting body, which a, a squash, a pumpkin, any of those will be doing, um, so morning versus late isn't as important as long as it's getting about eight. Okay. Uh, the, she said she's dealing with several microclimates and trying to find the right spot. She direct seeded squash two weeks ago and they've not sprouted yet. Uh, two weeks with a squash. Um, yeah, you probably should have seen one or two. You, I mean, I, I might, if you planted a bunch and you don't mind losing one, I might go try to see if you can find one of those seeds, see if it's even broken dormancy. Now, trick, make sure when you're planting seed that you don't plant it too deep. Uh, it's about the depth as the seed is wide is about the trick with seeds. So if you plant it too deep, it may not may run out of energy before it's able to pop the surface. Um, and also, if it, you got to make sure it stays wet. If it ever got a chance to dry out, that can that can kill those little those little seedlings way before they even come out the ground as well. With us having so much rain, if you're up here by me, it probably didn't dry out, but it is possible. Fair enough. Um, um, I know we're kind of transitioning topics uh, yeah. into like, you know, uh, beginner vegetable gardening, basically. Um, do you have any like tips just in general of what to, how to start a garden? You know, like anything you want to give uh, beginner gardeners for vegetables. So starting with vegetables makes it easier. I'm picking a topic. There you go. Um, when it comes to gardening, though, obviously we just talked about picking that sunny spot. Finding that location is the first step you always want to go for. Okay. Uh, if you don't have it, you're always going to struggle. Uh, the next step you're going to want to figure out is if you want to do a traditional in-ground garden, a raised bed, or if you're in a smaller area, if you're going to do containers. Uh, if you're in-ground, soil test, you're going to want to do that because you're going to need it so you know what's there. Um, and you kind of build your recipe around that. The soil testing lab will give you kind of a, uh, based on your vegetable selections, will give you a, a direct feed of like, this is what to put out. They're always going to tell you nitrogen every, no matter what you choose, because no matter what, everything's going to need it. It disappears too quickly in nature. Sure. Um, if you're going to do a raised garden bed, obviously still stick with that sunlight idea. Try to get it somewhere near a water source because you're going to have to water it a little more often because it's, it's not going to get that uh, water retention in the ground would. But uh, you're going to want to try to get it about 12 inches tall uh, with, I typically recommend no wet beds wider than about four feet. The reason being is you want to be able to reach the center from anywhere. So if, you, if you're doing a circle, no more than a four foot circle so you can reach the side from anywhere if it's a rectangle. You know, doesn't matter how long it is, it be 20 foot long, but about four feet wide at most so that you can still reach the inside. Uh, and obviously, if you're if you have children trying to help you, you might want to shrink it up a little bit so that it's a little easier for them to reach and help you. Um, the, but filling it's going to be the bigger problem, the biggest concern that you're going to want to make sure you really spend some time thinking about. You're going to want to spend a little extra money up front to get a good quality soil or soilless media to put into that raised bed. 
Okay. Uh, those folks in South Louisiana, there's a bunch of nurseries I know of that sell great garden mixes for us up here. There's a few stores as well, right along the I-49 corridor that sell these, but almost any of your box stores, any of your local garden centers will have something they would recommend. Uh, don't feel bad if you're at a, if you're at a uh, commercial store, normally there's almost always a bag that's busted open. Look at it. You're going to want to kind of feel it. Um, make sure there's not too many hard wood chips, you know, that you have some smaller organic particles. Uh, the beauty of that one, though, with you in a raised bed or containers is that first year, we're not so worried about soil fertility because you're going to give it everything you're going to want. Um, the Louisiana Vegetable Guide, uh, Home Vegetable Guide, which you can find online real easily, will kind of give you an idea of fertilizing for the first year. But you're going to you're going to give it everything it needs. And then if you're using a raised bed, maybe the third year you go ahead and do a soil test because that soil that you put in there is already starting to break down and it's retaining some of that nutrients that you put in over the years. But for those first year or two, something like a triple 13 or triple eight was is ideal for those kind of situations. Okay. And I just added the uh, vegetable planning guide link in the comments, guys. For those who want to know what it looks like, if you haven't clicked the link yet, I actually have that one too. Bam! You got all the publications, Mark. Uh, I just grabbed them all in my truck, huh? in my mobile office. Uh, TJ's asking, why is it important to grow local Merlotons versus C-A-Y-O-T-E in the grocery store, or is it not important? Uh, for Melotons, um, that is something that's going to be a little more South Louisiana than me. Uh, we were a little have Melotons up here. I'm not sure the difference. Uh, now, we, we do have some native type varieties. Um, the, as I say, coyote, I can't see what it says. C A Y O T E. I, I don't know what that is. Uh, I'm assuming that's some type of variety uh, type. Uh, I, I would assume that that's just a specific cultivar that they've bred. Uh, but I, I wouldn't know for certain. I don't think there'd be really any pros or cons over choosing one or the other. Okay. Okay. Those are pretty hardy when it comes to growing them. So there's not really too much that's going to get to them. Fair enough. Um, what should people be planting right now? So yeah, right now we're kind of going into the end of April beginning. We're still in the time period where if you want to get out your tomatoes, your eggplants, um, your bell, your bell peppers, your hot peppers. I would do those from transplants at this point. Okay. Uh, cause you, you, you're still fine, but you're you pushing it cause you don't want to get them out. You want them to get in and get flower and get grown before it gets too hot. Your hot peppers will, will keep producing all summer, but your tomatoes for many of you have already noticed if you've done it before, once we start getting those 90 degree days, they'll start dropping their flowers and you'll get a reduced yield on your tomatoes. But other things like, um, cantaloupe, collard, mm -hmm. corn, uh, uh, honeydew, lima beans, loofahs, for those who just have some kids and want to do something kind of fun. Um, your bird, your um, birdhouse squashes are great for right now, again, for kids and projects. Some of your um, your spinaches will still be all right. Okra is great now. It's going to survive the heat easily. Uh, again, because we're at home, if you if you want, you have small children, okra is a wonderful one. They really can't plant it too deep. They can pretty much throw it out there. It'll grow. It's a very resilient plant. Um, if you have an area that you, if you're, if you're a first time gardener and you, you're afraid that you're, you're going to forget to water it too regularly, but you still want to try something out. I recommend that okra. It's, it's, like I said, it's extremely forgiving. It's great for that first time grower. Um, I wouldn't quite start your pumpkins yet if, unless you're just wanting them for the actual pumpkin, if you're trying to get them for your, um, Halloween time that, or at Thanksgiving, you're going to want to look at the, the variety you're going to want to grow and look at that dates to harvest. Now our guide that we have, we'll show you based on averages. This is how many dates it takes to, to yield. Uh, but it's going to be a trick on kind of matching that up because that's not the normal time period. We grow pumpkins. Okay. We'll also state if you're going to try pumpkins, um, if it's the first time you ever try anything like this, maybe I'll start with one or two. Or they take up a lot of space and they're going to require you to take a little more care of them because they, they, uh, they can succumb to some diseases and fungi that'll kind of rot the, the pumpkin as it develops. Um, but things like snap beans or southern bees, uh, squashes, sweet potatoes, if, you, if you're if you wanting to try it, um, Swiss chard, water bones are great when you can still get in the ground right now. Um, uh, Today's got a question. I want to start a raised bed but have grass growing in the area now. Can I put cardboard down in the bed then put dirt on top? Perfect answer. Yes, that's 100% perfect. That's, that's a wonderful answer. Yes, you can either use cardboard. Um, some people will use trash bags. What you're trying to do is block the sunlight. Uh, if you don't want to use a herbicide and kill it all, 
Um, that's fine for those folks who are going organic, but they want to do it quicker than cardboard. Something like vinegar, it's a, it's a, it's a contact, it's an organically labeled contact herbicide. Uh, I still use APC cardboard so that you can spray your lines. So you don't spray the vinegar too far out. What that'll do is that'll kill it all above the ground. Now the grass and everything will grow back if you use those. So you're going to want to cultivate that area, which means just kind of break it up, small mantis tiller, uh, hand trowels, shovel if it's a larger area. But yes, the cardboard is a wonderful idea. Block it out. It's probably going to take about two weeks for it to really do a lot of uh, good and break it down. Beauty of the cardboard is once it's killed the grass underneath, uh, I would still recommend going through and just even if it's just a lawn fork, breaking up that soil that's underneath it, making so that that you don't form a future hard pan. And then the beauty of that cardboard, I would leave it there and then put your bed on top because it'll break down over time and just add to the organic matter. That makes sense. Okay. Right. Yeah, that's a wonderful idea. Huh. All right. Um, we've had a couple of questions when it comes to raised beds on what type of lumber should they use? Like, do they need to tr use treated lumber? Like what should they use? So that's, again, it's going to come down to how, how long you want to survive. Um, now for those folks who are kind of fearful of using treated lumber, there have been countless studies showing that the, the chemicals used that treat that they treat lumber with nowadays, uh, they do not leach out and get into the vegetables for consumption. So there, there's no fear from that uh, of leaching and being consumed. But as far as preference, I've seen beds built out of standard lumber that have survived five, six years. Now that that's not maybe ideal. The treated lumber might last longer. It's be a little more expensive, but it'll last you longer up front. But there's also options of uh, galvanized steel or um, for those who just want something a little longer lasting, they actually use that recycled tire plastic uh, siding type stuff now for decking. I've seen those where they'll cut a trench into the side of a four by four and just kind of slide it in, make a raised bed out of that. Looks great. Um, so about last, well, virtually forever. It's going to dry rot eventually in South Louisiana, or in Louisiana, but it will it will survive for a good while. Can you also use cinder blocks? Cinder blocks work great. Uh, any of the landscape stones. It's really it's all up to you. It's it's it really comes down to your imagination. Um, tires. If you're if you have an old if you have a, a family member or a location that's a farmer near you that has some old tractor tires, they work great. Um, the, obviously, the bigger the better because you can get more in them. Um, same deal. You, there's very, there's been studies showing that, that, that it doesn't really leach into the vegetables. I personally wouldn't plant my, my root crop right next to the edge of the tire, maybe go a little further in, but that's just preference. It does nothing to do with any fears. Um, David was asking when watering, should you water early in the morning? If so, is there a best practice on how, I don't I, I don't understand this question, but anyways, watering in the morning. So watering. Um, all, all, you don't want any water on the leaves. That's going to be the big trick. So we'll use tomatoes as an example. Uh, drip irrigation or micro where it just kind of sprinkles right by the base of the plant is ideal. If uh, if that's not optional for you, if you have a large garden, you use just your lawn sprinkler, just kind of uh, aerial spray type deals. That's fine. The trick's going to be getting out early in the morning. Just like you would water your lawns, you want to water early in the morning. Uh, lawns is like, you know, 4 to 6 a.m., uh, right, right during the sun, uh, vegetable gardens about the same, somewhere in that 6, 7 a.m. range, 8 a.m. The trick's going to be you want to get the water out there, let it water for however long you think you need it to get that inch that you'll need, and then uh, turn it off, and then I'll give it all day to dry out any water that may be on the plants. Uh, if you know you have things like uh, your melons, your watermelons, all of those that you're trying to grow, and your your areas are staying a little wetter, it's when you're going to try to really watch those because those can, can – those big melons, those big fruiting bodies that are sitting on the ground can come to diseases pretty easily. Mm. He said he has a micro head sprinkler system. So most of the micro sprinklers, um, there's a few different varieties. They call them uh, uh, bubblers, which will throw like the spider leg look out. Those work great by the base of a plant. There's also shrublers, which throws more of like an umbrella shape, goes up and out. Um, those both work wonderfully. The trick will be if you're throwing the water upward at all, uh, Either if it's something that's on a trellis, like a tomato, you can prune some of those lower leaves off so that it doesn't get too, too high or turn it down and throttle that pressure down on those, those sprays so they just don't spray up too, too much. Um, if it's dripped, that's perfect. If it's a micro drip, but yeah, it, you should be fine. Uh, if you have any other questions on that specifically, I have a lot of background in irrigation. I'm happy to help with those. So you can email me and we can kind of discuss that uh, more one-on-one. -on -one. And it's, uh, I'm going to put your email address back in there, Mark. It's in That's no problem. at LSU Ag Center. Yep, LSU.edu. Oh, you're just doing the LSU.edu one? Well, no, it's agcenter.lsu.edu. Okay, got it. 
Gotcha. There we go. All right. Um, do you have anything else to add? Because we might be wrapping up soon. Um, I mean, it's really getting out there and kind of enjoying yourself. Uh, basically, summing it all up, though, the, the healthier you can get your lawn up front, the healthier your soil is, the easier this will all be. Your vegetables, it's the same way. The more sun you can give it, the healthier, the more food you can give them or more vitamins you can give them uh, so they can produce their own food, the healthier and the easier you'll find everything else. Um, following your guides, especially for those first time gardeners, take, take an extra day or so, read those little guides out. Uh, that vegetable guide has a ton of information. If something doesn't make sense, contact your local agent. Like you said, we are working. We may not be at our office, but we are working. Um, and and like, I want to add in there that like our agents are a free resource to the public. Like you don't right. have to pay for that. You can email them with anything you have and they will answer you. Um, yeah. Uh, if I can't answer, I will find you an answer. Horticulture related guys. Uh, uh, I, I've gotten questions on cats. I mean, I will find, I will try my best to help you. Um, that's not my area, but I will try. You can email horticulture agents. But yeah. uh, a free resource to the public. And right now, all our agents are working from home. So remember to email them. Don't call them because they're not at their office. Um, and Charles did ask, he's got another question. If you use a sure. drip system, do you have a recommended layout for beds? I have dry spots. Okay. So with drip irrigation, um, and I see like the brown tubing is, is a comment. Uh, that's probably um, – it's probably got a regulated dripper in it every 12 or 14 or, or six inches. Uh, with those, it's going to be a little more tricky because you're going to want to lay it out. They don't want to space those lines any more than about a foot apart. And so if you have a four foot wide bed, there may be three strips going through it, one a foot in and then one right down the middle. Uh, it's just going to depend on how you're planting your plants. Uh, if you're using a soaker hose, that's going to be the most common, but the most difficult for you. So if you're using a soaker hose, and for those folks who are thinking about it, your farthest end from the, where the water comes into your garden, the end of that soaker hose, that's where you're going to want to put something that can survive a little less water, something like an okra plant. Uh, the reason being is soaker hoses don't regulate pressure or flow. So the first about third of the, the length will get majority of the water. The second third will get a little bit. And that last third is going to be not necessarily dry, but it's it's not going to get a whole lot. Um so yeah, the, 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 but the micro drips, um, which I'm seeing, I'm seeing in my pop-up now that you're using the micro drips that are 12 inches apart, those regulate flow and pressure. So if you had, again, if you, it's all about a foot spacing. So whatever your first line is, go 12 inches over and that's another line should be there. That way, the way they will work is when you irrigate those, the way those work is they will slowly spread outward in the soil profile, making a cone and those cones will overlap underground. So you'll be able to see, you, you could actually dig down and find and see where the water is. It's, it works fairly well. All right. There you go. Uh, Mark is like an irrigation expert. <laughs> I won't go that far, but I, I've done my fair share. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Um, Janet is asking, though this might be more entomology related, but is there a natural way to kill Asian ladybugs? So the ladybird or the, the ladybird beetle. Um, yeah. The Asian lady bird beetles asian lady beetle not that i know of offhand um that'd be a contacting your local entomologist uh we have them on campus we have someone within each region and actually mark i want to jump in because we're actually having an entomologist come on on thursday nathan lord Perfect. so y'all check out um uh, yeah, y'all check out our live at five on thursday we're having our entomologist on and he can answer all of your your bug questions. So that would be a great one for him. Um, <laughs> Otherwise, email me. I could. I know I can find you an answer. Um, I, I mean, like I said, there's a bunch of contact insecticides that'll work. It's going to depend on kind of where these these uh, lady be ladybugs are. Uh, if they're in your, your landscape or if they're in your vegetable garden, because that's going to depend on what we can use. Because it's all a matter about that label we talked about earlier with chemicals. The label is a law. So if it tells you you're not supposed to use it in vegetables, you're not supposed to use it in vegetables or vice versa. That's a struggle. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, if, if you're if you're able to, you know, you can email me as well I if, or wait till Thursday and ask the question then. And we can try to figure out that kind of stuff for you. That's not a problem at all. And uh, Charles. Charles said, oh, wow, I have work to do with his irrigation system. <laughs> it's yeah, yeah the, the, the beauty of it is there's always work to do, but it's 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 not work if you're having fun. So 
Uh, I look at it that way. If, if you're out there, you're enjoying it. You're in the sun. As you can see, my I've got a little too much sun the last few days. I'm a little red, but uh, I think I'm doing it. Uh, Charles is asking, is there any? Oh, recommended homemade sprays to keep pet rabbits out of the garden? Um, that's actually a really good question. Um, I don't know of any sprays offhand. I mean, I've heard the whole, just like with dogs, things like cayenne pepper and all of those can work. Um, with a rabbit though, you might be better off doing just a, a physical barrier, um, would probably be your best bet. Just trying to keep them away just like you would with, with birds or anything else. Uh, I'm not sure on that one though. Uh, that's okay. another one of those questions. If you email me, I can see, I can look it up and see if I can find you some information that, uh, that has anything labeled for, for well, trying to keep them away without harming them. Yeah, fair enough. David asked if I could repost the soil test site. Um, I, David, I just reposted for you. Um, Pam said she's really enjoying these calls. Please keep them coming. And, uh, TJ just said, can you do a microgreens talk on a different day? This is my third call and I'm learning a lot. So Mark, I appreciate you being here. Cause oh, uh, happy to help. I think everyone was really excited to learn so much today. Cause I mean, you went to total two different topics and I think it was awesome. Thank you. Uh, we, we, all of us agents, we're, we're getting pretty good at uh, multitasking and jumping from topics. So don't feel bad if you, uh, if you get on a call with one of us or on an email and you, you talk about four or five topics, we do that to ourselves. So as you can see, it's not a problem. All right. Well, thank you. Um, Y'all join us again on Thursday. We're doing a live at five with uh, Nathan Lord, our entomologist, and uh, we will see y'all later. Y'all keep planting. Y'all have a wonderful day.